Good evening, and thank you so much for joining me tonight for a conversation on racial profiling and police brutality against black women and LGBTQ people and women and LGBTQ people of color. I'm going to start off with a pop quiz. You don't need to worry. You're not being graded on this. There's no right or wrong answers. Just the first one that pops into your head. What is the first name that comes to mind when I say police brutality? The answer tends to be generational, but almost universally male. Rodney King, Amadou Diallo, Oscar Grant, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Freddie Gray. Any of these names come to mind? Or these? Or any of the names on my t-shirt? And if not, why not? And how were their experiences similar to or different from those of the men whose stories have driven our analysis and our responses to racial profiling and police violence? And how would centering their stories change the conversation? For instance, Eleanor Bumpers was shot by New York City Housing Police in 1986, six years before Rodney King was beaten by the LAPD, as she was being evicted from her public housing unit not far from here for being behind on her rent of less than $100 a month. If her case had become iconic in the way that King's did, maybe in addition to talking about driving while black, we'd also be talking about living while elderly, poor, disabled, and female. Latanya Haggerty was killed the same year as Amadou Diallo. In her case, it was a traffic stop instead of a street stop, and her cell phone instead of a wallet that the cop who shot her mistook for a gun. But if her story had garnered the same national attention that Diallo's did, we wouldn't still be issuing a call to say her name and recognize black women as targets of police violence. Many people know about Eric Garner, but fewer know of Roseanne Miller, a seven-month pregnant black woman who was put in a chokehold by an NYPD officer just weeks after Eric Garner was killed by one. Like Garner, who was being harassed by police for allegedly selling loose cigarettes, Miller was also being harassed by officers engaged in broken windows policing. In her case, the interaction started when the police officers threatened to ticket Miller and her husband for grilling outside of their own home. Fortunately, unlike Garner, she lived to tell the tale. Thinking about her experiences not only broadens our understanding of the impacts of broken windows policing, it also points us towards the need to pay greater attention to the use of force against pregnant women. Just three months after Mike Brown, Tanisha Anderson was killed in Cleveland by officers who were called to assist her in a mental health crisis. Yet her case did not spark a rebellion in her hometown or across the country, and has not played the iconic role that Brown's continues to play in the current moment and in the movement to end police violence. And Maya Hall was killed just outside of Baltimore, just weeks before Freddie Gray's case rocked Baltimore and the nation, for essentially taking a wrong turn onto NSA property. Not given the benefit of the doubt, she and her unarmed passenger were shot first and asked questions later. Her black trans life, like Gray's, was treated as if it was of no consequence. Black women are uniquely impacted by state-sponsored and state-sanctioned violence, but not exclusively. These graphics created by the Native Youth Sexual Health Network point out that indigenous women have been targeted since Columbus first landed on the shores of this continent. Asian women have also experienced exclusion, deportation, and violence at the hands of immigration authorities and have also been targets of police violence, as well as ongoing profiling in the context of policing of prostitution and trafficking, which is a form of racial profiling that we don't often talk about. Arab, Muslim, South Asian, and Middle Eastern women have also been targets of state violence throughout the country's history, and particularly since 9-11. This is Shamtali Huk, a Muslim South Asian law professor, who was arrested while standing on a sidewalk outside a restaurant in Times Square while waiting for her family to use the restroom inside. She was charged with blocking the sidewalk, resisting arrest, and disorderly conduct. She and her family had been attending a rally in support of Gaza immediately before this interaction, which no doubt also contributed to her arrest, because if you've ever been to Times Square, you know that how many tourists and theater goers block the sidewalk and are never subjected to this kind of treatment. Huck was later told at the police station that where she gave a different last name than her husband, that in America, married women take their husband's names. And finally, of course, Latinas are in the crosshairs of local police, border patrol, and immigration enforcement. This is Jesse Hernandez, a 17-year-old queer Latina killed by Dunder police in January 2015. That said, today my remarks will focus on black women and LGBTQ people, both because those are the communities that I'm from and work in, but also as a contribution to the current conversation sparked by the Black Lives Matter movement. Our next pop quiz question, 
What is the first image that comes to mind when I say racial profiling? Was it Sandra Bland? While her experiences catapulted black women's experiences of driving while black to the forefront of national consciousness, it certainly was an anomaly. In fact, nationwide, when data is disaggregated by both race and gender, the rates of racial disparities in traffic and pedestrian stops are identical among women and men. For instance, right here in New York City, by looking at the by now quite well-known stop and frisk data, we see that the percentage of stops of black women among all stops of women is almost identical to the percentage of black men among all men stopped, and vastly disproportionate to the black population in New York City. And the same is true of stops involving Latinos and Latinas. Yet racially discriminatory stop and frisk practices have almost exclusively been described as affecting black and Latino men. And these racial disparities, which are the product of both racial profiling and discriminatory enforcement, play a central role in the skyrocketing rates of incarceration of black and Latina women over the past three and a half decades. After all, women don't just show up in prison. Someone puts them there, and most often the path to prison starts with a police encounter. During those encounters, women and LGBTQ people of color also experience gender-specific forms of violation, such as harassment about ID that doesn't match the gender identity that you're expressing, or the gender identity that a police officer thinks you should be expressing, groping and inappropriate comments during frisks and searches, or sexual harassment and assault, or condoms. It was the first image that came to mind when I said racial profiling, condoms. Probably not, but it's true that condoms can be used as a tool of racial profiling when they're confiscated and cited as evidence of intent to engage in prostitution-related offenses. Of course, this doesn't happen to everyone. Um, it depends on who carries them, what they're wearing, and where they are. In the case of my client, a black trans woman, nine New York City condoms, city condoms produced by the city of New York and branded as such, were allegedly found in her purse when she was walking to McDonald's in the West Village in the early morning of a Saturday night, as we are all often want to do after coming to the club. Um, and the condoms that were allegedly found on her were cited as evidence that she was engaged in prostitution. And of course, this would not happen to a straight white man on the other side of Sixth Avenue by NYU. He could be carrying so many condoms, they could be literally falling out of his pockets, and he would simply be perceived as following good public health messaging and perhaps overly helpful. But for women of color, trans and not trans, the presence of condoms, in essence, becomes a tool of gender and sexuality-based racial profiling, and a tool to police and punish perceived deviant sexualities. And in addition to contributing to deportation and incarceration of people whose conduct is perceived as deviating from racialized gender norms, use of condoms as evidence of criminal intent is another way that the state explicitly interferes with reproductive autonomy of women of color, interfering with access to contraception and our ability to prevent uh, and protect ourselves from unwanted pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. And it's also something that's done in the name of protecting women that, in fact, harms women. It's something that also affects LGBTQ young people and gender nonconforming young people. Bringing us to our next quiz question. What is the first image that comes to mind when I say police violence? For most people, it's something like this. The person on top tends to be perceived to be a white officer, and the person on the other end of the baton generally is perceived to be a black man, who, by the way, is never perceived to be queer or transgender. But maybe you thought about this, given the events of the last year. This is the assault on a young black girl by a school police officer at Spring Valley High in South Carolina. Largely the first thing that comes to mind when I say police brutality is police shootings and excessive force. But even within that frame, when we extend our analysis along the axes of gender and sexuality, different subjects come into view. In the case of my clients, Tiffany Jimenez and Jeanette Gray, two black lesbians beaten by the police. In their case, the visual was the same, but the officer on top was a black man, and the people under the baton were black lesbians. And the words shouted at them during the beating, dyke ass bitch, were a variation on the usual. In addition to making different subjects visible, extending our analysis along the axes of gender and sexuality also brings into view different contexts, uh, gender-specific contexts, in which police violence takes place, such as the policing of prostitution and the private spaces of the home and workplace. So again, my client, a Latina trans woman, was thrown to the ground by an officer during a prostitution sting, who then proceeded to stomp on her head three times, breaking a bone in her face and a tooth. And as that was happening, her skirt rode up, exposing her genitals, which an officer then grabbed and twisted while calling her faggot. And all of this took place in the home, away from cop-watching cameras. 
Extending our analysis along the axes of gender and sexuality also allows us to see gender-specific forms of police brutality, like that experienced by Nicola Robinson, an eight-month pregnant black woman, who here is pointing to the spot where a police officer, a Chicago police officer, punched her hard, sending her to the hospital in early labor and leaving a bruise that lasted for weeks. The words he yelled as he punched her, you black bitch, you're lucky I don't kill your fucking baby, leave no doubt that his actions were informed by both her race and gender. Generally, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about police brutality is excessive and fatal force. But extending the analysis around the axes of gender and sexuality brings into view police sexual violence, such as that committed by Oklahoma City police officer Daniel Holsclaw, whose sexual assault of 13 black women prompted an Associated Press year-long investigation, revealing that over a thousand officers had lost their law enforcement licenses over a five-year period due to sexual misconduct. And those were just the ones who were caught and held accountable. Law enforcement officials and advocates alike will tell you this number is just the tip of the iceberg. Holzclaw's case and his targets were only unusual in that he was caught, convicted, and sentenced to 267 years in prison. But in fact, sexual misconduct and rape by law enforcement agents is the second most frequently reported form of police misconduct after excessive force, but it's certainly not the second most frequently talked about. And it's not just a problem of a few rogue officers like Holzclaw who can be made an example of, um, and held accountable, but rather part of the regular repertoire of police brutality in the United States. In this study of close to 550 arrests of police officers for sexual misconduct over a two-year period, over half the cases involved on-duty sexual misconduct, close to a third involved forcible rape, one-fifth involved forcible fondling, and even more alarmingly, a quarter involved minors. One New York City study found that two in five young women of color report sexual harassment by police. That's two in five young women of color in New York City report sexual harassment by police. And LGBTQ young people were twice as likely to report sexual misconduct as their heterosexual peers. In New Orleans, 59% of transgender people surveyed by breakout um, had experienced extortion of sexual acts by law enforcement officers. And alarmingly, police misconduct all too often takes place in the context of police responses to domestic violence and sexual assault. This is Tiawanda Moore, a survivor of domestic violence, who was then sexually assaulted by responding officers. To compound matters, she was then prosecuted when she went to file a complaint and was being discouraged from doing so by the officers who referred to her job as a dancer in a club. Um, she decided she would record them discouraging her from filing a complaint, and she was prosecuted for unauthorized taping of, another, of a conversation without the other person's consent by former district attorney, Chicago District Attorney Anita Alvarez, who's no longer in office. And this is part of the reason that activists were so angry with her. I mean, obviously Laquan McDonald had a great deal to do with it, but Tiawanda Moore's story outraged a number of the activists who were involved in putting her out of office. Although the felony charges against her were eventually dismissed, the message sent loud and clear was that if you come forward to complain about police sexual misconduct, you'll be the person put on trial, not the officer who violated you. So as a result, Homeless and low-income women, lesbian and trans women, and women who are or are perceived to be involved in the drug or sex trades are particularly targets for sexual violence by police who, like Holsclaw, trade on fear of retaliation and on the assumption that they won't be believed if they do come forward. And that assumption is all too often proven to be correct. Ten years before Holsclaw's case came to light, another officer, this time in Eugene, Oregon, was tried for a very similar pattern of abuse. And in his case, the record showed that women came forward early on to complain and that their complaints, while documented, were dismissed as the grumblings of junkies and prostitutes. Yet there's no official data collection on police sexual misconduct in the country, nationally or at the local level. And the vast majority of police departments I surveyed have absolutely no policy specifically addressing this issue. Police sexual violence also takes the form of brutal, racialized, violent, and degrading strip searches and body cavity searches conducted most often in the context of the war on drugs, such as the ones that Brandy and Alexandra were subjected to, as you can see here, by the side of the road in Texas by state troopers who claim to have spelled marijuana during a traffic stop. And searches can simply be another tool of sexualized police brutality. That was the, the case for Diane Bond, a middle-aged black woman who was living in Chicago's Cabrini Green public housing complex, who was subjected to strip searches and body cavity searches repeatedly in her own home as part of a larger pattern of police terror against her. Police sexual misconduct can also take the form of gender searches, which are unlawful and degrading and humiliating and unconstitutional searches conducted for the purposes of assigning gender based on anatomy. That was a search that was experienced by Juan Evans, a black transgender man who was first stopped for driving while black 
and then subjected to a strip search to assign him a gender based on his anatomy. Racialized gender policing takes many forms. Duana Johnson was a black transgender woman who, like so many black women, was profiled for prostitution while simply walking down the street. She was arrested solely based on the fact that she was a black woman, she was transgender, she was out late at night, and nothing else. There was no other evidence. There was no client, no exchange of money, no offer of sex. Once taken to the police precinct, she was beaten bloody by Memphis police officers who arrested her because she asserted her gender identity and refused to answer to a homophobic slur. She told the officers, that's not the name my mother gave me and that's not the name I chose for myself. Like Rodney King's, her beating was caught on video, but unlike his, it didn't spark a national uprising. Cases like Duana's exemplify the kinds of racialized policing of gender and sexuality that continues to take place on a daily basis, even as laws that are discriminatory on their face, whether they're sumptuary laws that require you to wear certain articles of clothing assigned, associated with your gender, or common nightwalker laws that criminalized women for being on the streets alone at night, or sodomy laws that criminalized uh, people engaged in what is perceived to be same-sex conduct. Even as those laws are struck down, ultimately police don't just enforce discriminatory laws that can be challenged or changed or repealed. They make law every single day in the context of countless routine and mundane determinations about what constitutes reasonable suspicion to stop someone? What constitutes probable cause to arrest them? Who's suspect? Who's credible? Who belongs? Who doesn't? Whose presence signals disorder? And whose does not? whose conduct to scrutinize, and whose to ignore. So the Broken Windows policing paradigm, which originated right here in New York City, and which has since spread like wildfire across the country, facilitates this kind of racialized policing of gender and sexuality. It's based on the notion that leaving signs of disorder, like broken windows, um, unattended and unpunished, will inevitably lead to entire communities descending very quickly into violence, chaos, and mayhem. The theory has no scientific basis, um, it later evolved to also posit that punishing low-level offenders like turnstile jumpers would prevent these individuals from becoming murderers and rapists and individuals who would otherwise descend into a life of crime. And again, without scientific basis. And although the theory purports to address physical conditions and behaviors, the article on which Broken Windows Policing is premised explicitly names the public presence of particular types of people as embodied signs of disorder, which must be rooted out. Youth, homeless people, people perceived to be engaged in prostitution, and unattached adults, reinforcing very heteronormative notions of who's a good citizen. And the precursors to this article were much more explicit about the racial and gendered makeups of its targets. It said, signs of disorder include young black men, young women in short shorts, hanging out on corners, interracial couples, and gay people. So implementation of broken windows policing is characterized by the proliferation of and really aggressive and discriminatory enforcement of regulations which criminalize an ever-expanding set of behaviors and activities in public spaces, which could include standing, which is called loitering, sitting, lying, sleeping, eating, drinking, urinating, littering, making noise, approaching strangers, um, as well as a number of more vague conducts like being disorderly or being lewd. And it makes it very difficult to exist in public spaces without potentially breaking one. How many folks here have littered at some point in their lives? How many of you have ever gotten tickets for it? Broken Windows policing, however, has given police an unlimited power to stop, ticket, and arrest, which dramatically lowers the bar for what reasonable suspicion is or probable cause is, and dramatically increasing the frequency and intensity of interactions with youth of color, low-income and homeless people, public housing residents, and people engaged in street-based survival economies, whatever they may be, and street vendors, or anyone else who's hyper-visible in public spaces, including trans and gender non-conforming people. So within this broader context, police interactions are, inter are informed by perceptions of black women and queer folks as literally embodying a racially gendered and sexualized disorder in public space, which often translates directly into a charge of disorderly conduct or of unreasonable noise or loitering for the purposes of prostitution simply for being in a public space. There's been a lot of talk of bathrooms of late with all eyes focused on North Carolina's new law but policing of the gender binary has been taking place for decades, um, centuries, across the country. And if we look through the lens of broken windows policing, it happens through often violent arrests for disorderly conduct. Being in a bathroom, uh, 
that is perceived to be the incorrect bathroom for the gender that you are expressing or that you were assigned at birth um, is perceived by officers as inherently disorderly and therefore grounds for arrest, even where no specific law like the one in North Carolina exists. Bathrooms are also a site in which gay and gender nonconforming men are profiled and discriminatory arrested for allegedly engaging in lewd conduct in public restrooms and public parks. Again, a hallmark of broken windows policing. And unfortunately, similar forms of racial profiling and police violence based on perceptions of being inherently violent, inherently disorderly, inherently out of place, and out of the frame of victimhood take place in the context of police responses to calls for assistance. That was the case for Tanisha Anderson. That was the case for Janisha Fonville, who was killed by Charlotte police responding to a call for assistance during a fight with her girlfriend. And that was the case for Aura Rosser, who was killed by Ann Arbor police, who were also responding to an incident of domestic violence. And when not fatal, police responses to violence can re often result in arrests of black women survivors like Mar Marissa Alexander. Which brings us to our last question. What is the first image that comes to mind when I say violence against women? or hate crime? Is it any of the things that we've just been talking about for the last 20 minutes? If not, why not? Are they not clear examples of both? So what would it mean to center these narratives, experiences, and realities within our movements for police accountability and against violence? First, it means we need to expand our understanding and discourse about who's affected by racial profiling, by police violence, by racial discrimination and injustice in the criminal legal system, and by mass incarceration. It would mean shining a light on different subjects of police violence. It would mean getting information around different cases of police violence. It would mean supporting families of women and LGBT people of color who are killed and abused by police alongside the families of men lost to state violence. It would mean protesting different forms of police violence. It would mean answering a call to national action. It would also mean advancing expanded agendas for policy reform that are both inclusive of gender and sexuality and specifically address the experiences of women and LGBT people of color. But additionally, bringing black women and LGBT people to the center of our analysis will require us to engage in a wholesale reevaluation of society's law enforcement-based responses to violence, to poverty, and to mental health crises. Fortunately, we don't need to start from scratch. We can follow the leadership of groups who have been centering the experiences of black women and queer folks and women and queer folks of color in movements to end police violence and mass incarceration, some of them for decades. And no matter how we do it, as we challenge racial profiling, police violence, and mass incarceration, we need to commit to expanding our analysis, our approaches, and our agendas for change to incorporate the voices, the experiences, and the perspectives of women and LGBTQ people who are directly impacted by these issues. Because in the end, it's only by bringing all forms of state violence against all people and by valuing all black lives and leaving none behind that we'll ultimately achieve justice and liberation for all of us. Thank you.